Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, PubCon 2021. Um, this is a session about the Pulp CLI, and this should be for overview, uh, learnings, and challenges in the last year. My name is Matthias Davig. I'm working as a software engineer at the Pulp team. And Grant will push the slides for me today. Thank you for that. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, as I said, the agenda will be an overview, um, a short list of challenges the CLI has to face, and what we learned from all of this. Next slide, please. And again, um, the Pulp CLI was identified to be the number one blocker for Pulp 3 adoption in the field or migrating from Pulp 2 because Pulp 2 had some had a uh, command line interface to interface with it. Um, this is not so much for downstream products that integrate with Pulp because they do talk to the REST API themselves. So kind of from our perspective, Pulp always had its um, reason to exist. But for uh, people using Pulp directly, using the REST API is very tedious. And so that's, yeah, on, on multiple surveys, this was identified to be a blocker for not migrating or not even thinking about adopting Pulp. And uh, last year, uh, I think it's like 13 months ago at PubCon, we talked about that we want to have a CLI and we discussed how it should look like and we juggled some technologies. You can have a uh, look at this link. This should, uh, is, I think, the agenda of last year's talk to this topic. Next slide, please. Um, as I see it, the uh, CLI should be a usability layer because we already have the functional layer that is the REST API, but it's quite unusable. And so the CLI should have should add some value and that is usability for end users. And to me, that means there is no way we can auto-generate anything from a generated open API schema that is generated from a already hard to use REST API because in every step from there, it gets more complicated. On the other hand, it should be based on uh, workflows and not so much based around the REST API endpoints we already have, which the, uh, for example, the generated by, uh, Python bindings are. They are. There's like one interface for each REST endpoint the CLI, uh, the, the REST API provides. So the goal here is to focus on workflows because that's what users want to perform day to day. Next slide, please. Um, then there's another very big goal of the CLI, and I think we managed to uh, accomplish quite well. That's independence of server versions. For example, if you deploy Pulp, you may have your production environment, maybe one, maybe two, but you will probably also have evaluation environments. And when you now think at uh, your user interface, you are sitting at the one computer and you want to interface with multiple servers, they may live in multiple different versions of Pulp Core and even different versions of each plugin. And so, the official bindings identified as a non-starter here because they are very tightly bound to the very specific version of each single plugin. So when changing from one server to another, you would just be ending up installing a completely different environment for the other servers. So the solution taken here is we have a live Open API parser, which uh, gets all the Open API definition in runtime and looks at them and parses them. This code was borrowed from another project uh, called Squeezer, 
that is the collection of um, Ansible modules to control pulp, which is kind of a similar approach, and I will have uh, a little bit more to say to that later. And with this live open API parser, we always look at the current version of the server and all installed plugins in one go. And so we could implement version-dependent code paths here. So in the CLI, in the very core, there are two functions called has plugin and needs plugin. And uh, at some points, you can find horrible workarounds because versions on servers differ, but they are all guarded by functions like has plugins, uh, has plugin and needs plugin. So for example, um, a feature gets implemented in Pulp Core 3.2. 12, then you would query for has plugin, uh, then you would say needs plugin 3.11. And if you run that command against an older server, it will just tell you it's not available here because there's nothing you can do about it. On the other hand, if the format of one parameter ch changed slightly from maybe a um, comma separated list to a proper um, HTML, because uh, that, I don't know, to, to another form of list, then you can use a has plugin to um, format it right so the server can understand it, but the user doesn't even realize there's something different here. And yeah, over the time, I mean, it has just been a year, but over the time we already collected a load of those workarounds. And at some point, we just decided, OK, we do want to clean this up a bit. And in our CI, we already tested five successive pulp core versions with compatible plugins for each and every single commit. And so we decided what we can test is what we can support. And everything older than that, we will just uh, delete in the next release. And this has been the policy ever since. We support five successive pop call versions in the CLI. If there's a need for more, then uh, this is maybe the time to talk about it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the CLI has a plugin system, and this is, comes quite naturally along because our core has plugins, and so each of those plugins provide new uh, API endpoints. This kind of should be matched in the client tooling. So usually the subcommands for specific plugins are organized in the CLI plugins. But uh, we saw a lot of duplication here. So we added generic reusable sub-subcommands. So it's basically that you get Pulp file repository commands and Pulp RPM repository commands, Pulp Ansible repository commands, and the like. And those sub sub commands are usually very similar. And so we looked at this and saw this what is the generic part of it and provide functions to easily generate them in the plugins again. This plugin system is built in a way that plugins can live in the main tree of Pulp CLI and out of this tree. And to this point, there are two to three, I'd say, plugins living outside. That is the Debian plugin in very early stage and the OS tree plugin, which got some uh, important PRs merged in the last week, I think or in the last seven days. And then there's one for Erminic, which just lives in my space because I used it for testing the tasking system. So this is a very specific one. I, I wouldn't necessarily count this one. Um, for plugins that live out of tree, a small warning here, the CLI doesn't really provide a stable API yet. We try to be careful there. And yeah, I hope we will be communicating any necessary change. But yeah, 
there's no, no, no such thing as uh, semantic versioning on that yet. Or if you are really um, into semantic versioning, our first digit is zero. So that simply means there is no guarantee. Um, next slide, please. Well, one of the important points about the pub CLI is ex it exists. And this is different to last year. It is released and hosted on PyPy. The first release, I got just got the commit out here, happened on Friday, January 15 this year. And at the moment, I think we are at release uh, 0.16. Uh, I should know that. Um, uh, given this version numbers, as I told before, the CLI tries to be independent of pulp core versions, and that means we can just release it independently. We anticipate that it will work with the next version because the REST API shouldn't change that much. If it changes, we need to adjust and we will release, but if it doesn't change and we don't add any features, there's just no need to release the CLI with every uh, core release or even with every plugin release, which would be worse. The next point to uh, emphasize on is it is packaged with Cotello. Cotello is integrating with Pulp. So um, it's quite useful to have it in the RPM repositories there. I think it's packaged in a utilities repository, so it's not installed by default. And it's mainly for debugging purposes, because if you start to mess around with pulp, then Catello gets confused, and that's not something you want to see. Um, next slide, please. On to the challenges we saw this year. Um, as I said, uh, I don't see a way to auto-generate anything useful here. This means the commands are all handcrafted and based around workflows. And this naturally introduces feature gaps because um, Pulp Core is evolving. The CLI might not be catching up. The CLI was starting late compared to Pulp Core. So there's a long range. It didn't yet catch up. We try to make writing commands very, very easy, but we require tests for everything, that is, uh, for every function at least. And this ends up to be more code than the uh, actual command in some, time, some places. Um, uh, lately, we discussed ways to at least automate the way to find um, feature gaps, and there was the idea to just scan for each and every endpoint we hit and list all the ones we don't hit. That may be a valuable information. We haven't gone there yet. And on the other hand, it's not complete because just because we hit an endpoint doesn't mean we support every single feature of it and every single release. Yeah, this is really a hard task. So I think we settled with a docs initiative where we try to be aggressively verbose about what workflows we provide. And of course, we hope for issue reports that this and that should work in this workflow that is supposed to be supported. And yeah, basically, we look for corner cases here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned before there is a project called Squeezer, which provides Ansible modules to do a bit like the same thing. It's a client tooling for Pulp Core and its plugins. And it had the same problem of supporting a multitude of different server versions. So at one point, the OpenAPI parser was invented there. But Squeezer has a little bit of different uh, 
some environment to run in, it uh, is bound to Ansible. And at least to the moment, it uh, is built around the uh, requirement that it doesn't import any external library that isn't provided by Ansible itself. Also, Ansible supports Python 2. And so the Open API parser needs to run there too. So from that point, it kind of evolved. It, it's now Python 3 only, mostly for the reason that we added type annotations. And we switched to requests instead of the uh, shipped URL lib, which is a pain to use, I can say. So again, lately, we started a discussion, which is still open. If we should try to merge the effort again and say, OK, you just need external libraries to run the squeezer modules, but then they will benefit from being co-developed with the CLI again. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about this after this short introduction here. Um, the next slide, please. Um, the CLI has continuous integration, as I think all our projects have by this time. And as I said, we test five versions of the pub OCI images, single container, are they referred to most of the time? Actually, we test six versions. And that's interesting, because there are five versions for release pop core, and another one for the so-called nightly container, which installs pop core and all the, uh, and the whole plugin canon from source. Um, the test suite of the pop CLI does not only run in the CLI, but uh, it is run partially on selected plugins that opt in to run their corresponding CLI tests. So this is quite nice for integration. So we, uh, this way, at least we see very early if some plugin change will break the CLI or would break the CLI before it gets merged. But we don't catch all of those that way. And so it turns out that the CLI, as well as Squeezer, by the way, involuntarily act as the canary for end-to-end um, -end tests with multiple plugins. And that's by the virtue of this nightly container, which installs all components into a container from source each night. And then the next day, uh, the CLI may be broken on the nightly container, at least. Um, I, I wouldn't say this is a bad thing. It's just something maybe interesting to know. And I think everyone should have a look there from time to time to see everything's still fine. And we can, of course, discuss if there's a way to catch those errors earlier. Next slide, please. One of the greatest challenges is uh, we need contributions for all the feature gaps we have. And there's a suggestion I would make, and that is uh, consider that the CLI support for a feature could be developed along with the feature. And that is a bit like um, developing along with tests. And I do this regularly because I believe it's, or I, I um, for me, it's easier to run some CLI commands to test the code I'm implementing in any plugin. It's easier than doing the same thing with HTTP on the REST uh, API directly. So maybe that's something other people can like to learn too. Uh, next slide, please. This brings me to the learning section. And here, I want to say first, the CLI mini team is amazing. Um, it's only been a year since we had the kickoff discussion of we want to do this and we want to start here. And we have come to a place where we 
can support a lot of workflows in the CLI natively now. Um, it seems like the CLI is started to be used by people in the, the in the wild on production machines, and we get good feature requests and bug reports that way. So um, it has been a long time where we had the impression that we were the only ones fiddling around with the CLI. So this changed, and that is good. Another learning is a young project can move very fast because um, yeah, it has maybe no, not much dependencies. There's not much documentation already that needs to be adjusted at every time. This has the downside that we uh, still have a documentation lack there too. Um, another learning is young projects can experiment with technology. And this is really, I remember Grant saying every other week the thing looks completely different. But I think we've come to uh, a good technology now. So this kind of uh, um, condensed to a good state. Another thing is we implemented uh, type annotations in the CLI, and that's also something I wouldn't have done just to experiment on it on a bigger project. So this young project was just the right place to start doing something like that and learning how to do that. Um, for contributors, heads up, we aren't finished with factoring. I have several ideas how we could improve the structure of the whole code base. But it should be. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it shouldn't be the way that it looks completely different anymore. Um, one very personal learning for me, and this is the second time I've seen this, or actually the third time I've seen this. When you have a project and you do a lot of things, that are slightly different, but in repeated. Uh, places, and you want to remove boilerplate, you start to create your own framework. So the CLI is based on Click, which is a Python library for command line interfaces. But around this, we've built our own framework, basically. So I know when you want to start hacking on the CLI, there's something new to learn. Um, yes, and actually, I wanted to have this lot more of a discussion, and so I'm opening this up for discussions now. Can you move to the next slide briefly, please? Thank you all for listening. And one back, please. So any questions at this point? Yep, Grant. Um, so I'm just going to um, kind of reinforce that last point. Even though I have been involved with the CLI, I'm, I haven't done nearly as much work on it as Matthias and Jared and David have. Um, and when I go back to add a new command, having been away from it, even if there haven't been major changes, the answer, Tanya, I don't think it was 17 iterations, but I think it was, what, six or so, Matthias, major refactorings over the course of the last year-ish? Anyway. Um, I haven't counted. It. it is It is like learning, it is learning a new framework. And there's a lot of functionality there, but one of the things about moving fast and not having a lot of documentation is the way you learn how things work is by looking at other people's code. And sometimes that's not obvious. So what I, I, I think we'll be in, in that position for a bit. It's going to take a while to, to get the comments in and the documentation in that treat the, the work 
that has gone into making it possible to avoid a ton of boilerplate by documenting this as if it were an infrastructure that you were learning. Um, and that will help get us get us more contributions. But once you once you get your head around how how this all works, it's really easy to add commands and to test them. And uh, like Matthias, I have been trying to add CLI commands whenever I've added a feature or changed uh, or added an API, among other reasons, because it just makes my life easier in terms of testing uh, testing by hand and writing workflow documentation. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds to me like the CLI. Am I? Can one hear me? Yep. Yeah, yep. Correct. Okay. It sounds to me like the CLI provides like a abstraction layer around the API that does at least two things. So it abstracts from individual pulp core versions because it's compatible across five versions, you said. And it abstracts from the individual API endpoint to provide more workflow-based whatever it is. And that sounds to me like it's the exact same kind of thing you would need for the squeezer modules. So I want to go back to that point and ask, what, what, like, why aren't they merged from the get? Or I mean, I guess it was something for discussion and to just, yeah. Yeah, uh, good point. Um, actually, it's, uh, I'd say, three layers. There's the Open API parser, which just doesn't know anything about Pulp, but it knows about the Open API v3 format and how to translate data into uh, REST calls. And then there's the context framework it's called an hour uh in the cli it's kind of um it knows about resources on the server and it knows what open api calls it needs to call to do something with those objects um sadly well this is very very pulp specific and i think this is the place where all the version dependency should be moved um and sadly it's a little it, it knows a little bit about click if it would only know about pulp then this would be very usable by squeezer 2 and that's one of my re, uh, refactoring goals to make this layer very specific um to use the open api library and know about pulp but nothing else and then there's the Front end layer, so to call that's uh, translating click commands into using the context to ma manipulate pop. And so, from a higher perspective, you would just replace the interface layer with Ansible modules, and you would have gained a lot. Um, the problem, why it hasn't been done yet, is that. Um, Ansible modules usually shouldn't rely on any external library, but they can. So it's a question of whether we want, whether we are ready to drop that requirement, basically. And then, of course, it's the question of do we have time to invest on merging them? Thanks, Matthias. I just, um, I was just um, time, I was just time checking, Brian, but um, you. Just, uh, Brian, please, and then we'll move on to your session. It is a wise thing to time check me. You know how I like to talk. Um, so I was going to say two things. One, my hope for all the mini teams is that they can go look at their documentation and make sure that the CLI is kind of the first class example by example. And if we did that, if each mini team did that, then um, I think we'd see the usage of this excellent tool. It's truly amazing. I love it. Um, go up. Um, a lot of people don't even know about it. So. I think that would be good to do. The other thing um, regarding the deduplicating of the squeezer stuff, I'm a little skeptical, one, because it's additional investment, but two, because the more generalized this gets in terms of the technologies that it needs to work with, I just, I worry. 
um, that the project won't be able to move as fast as it needs to. But I'm an outsider, so you all would know better than me. But I'm just I'm skeptical that we should be doing that. So, uh, an, an opinion without much evidence. There you go. Doug, Matthias, if that's everything, I'll stop the recording. And if you'd like to discuss it further, we have time after this, or we definitely have time tomorrow. And there's this breakout yeah. room function for anything pertinent. Um, thank you. Thank you.